Summer Special in August 2021. Summertime and the listening is easy. Let's dive into summer fun with some beach time and sea bathing and then picnics and summer food, Tudor style. So kick back, get some sun, and enjoy a journey to summer's past. <music> It's time for our final summer special. Summer is coming to an end, and many of us are feeling like there's a chance for one more vacation. And for the Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, we're ready to hit the road, Tudor style. Elizabeth II is reported to have said, I have to be seen to be believed. With omnipresent media coverage, being seen is not much of a challenge for modern royals. In fact, their challenge seems to be finding a moment or two to be truly off-camera. Like the current queen, Tudor monarchs had to be seen to be believed. Unlike the current royals, Tudors didn't have the paparazzi to splash royal images across social media. The only social media available was word of mouth and court gossip. To counter rebellions and promote majesty and magnificence, the Tudors had to be seen at court and around the country. Rulers before and after the Tudors visited the farther regions of the country as well. But Tudor progresses went well beyond the average, just like everything else about the dynasty. So let's take a look at Tudor royal road trips. The Tudor court was actually always on the move. Basic hygiene required that the court remain in any one palace for just a few weeks before moving out so everything could be cleaned. Think of no indoor plumbing and no running water. After a few weeks, it was definitely time to move. During the spring and summer, those moves went beyond London into other parts of the country. This was for practical reasons in some ways. Plague and other illnesses often came during these months, and London was crowded and therefore dangerous. Getting out of the city made good sense to avoid contagion. But beyond the need for cleaning and the advantage of avoiding disease, the most important motive for spring and summer progresses was to see and be seen. It was important for the monarch to visit worrisome areas of the country. That way, the highest figures in the government could identify areas where trouble was brewing and make a preemptive strike to settle things down. In addition, the physical presence of majesty could be enough to convince would-be rebels to think twice or more about causing trouble. The size of the royal household and the presence of guards and knights was a visual reminder of the power of the monarch. Early progresses of the first and final Tudor monarchs give us some great insight into the potential power of the royal progress. Henry VII left on his first progress in early 1486, less than five months after his coronation and two months after his marriage to Elizabeth of York. It was a spring trip for the new king with stops in Waltham, Holy Cross, Cambridge, Huntington, and Stamford before arriving in Lincoln for Easter celebrations. The king and queen were accompanied by 200 bowmen attempting to demonstrate his power to the north of England and discourage any rebellions or other claims to his throne. Henry the Seventh drew attention to his piety in Lincoln. On Holy Thursday, he washed the feet of 29 poor men, the number representing each year of his age. He also distributed alms to them and other poor members of the city. He was demonstrating his devotion to God there and in visits to religious houses in several of the cities along the Progress Route. After Easter, he went to Nottingham, then north to Doncaster, Pontefract, and Tadcaster before arriving in York. He spent about a week in the stronghold of his predecessor and recently vanquished enemy, Richard III. As he came closer to York, 
His retinue swelled in number and glory, with many bishops, earls, lords, knights, esquires, gentlemen, and yeomen representing the government and military strength joining the progress. The king himself also took on greater glory at York, dressing in finer robes and cloth of gold. It was a deliberate show of regal presence and power, as the king knew there were some in that area who hoped to raise insurrections. The city set up pageants to reinforce a show of loyalty, according to records. A man introduced himself as the King of Britain and founder of York, and submitted his city to Henry the Seventh. And the traditional key to the city was also presented to the king. Another pageant had a council of the previous six Henrys discovering the glory of Henry the Seventh. There were other pageants celebrating the king, and the York visit was an apparent success. Then Henry the Seventh and his entourage headed back to London through the West Midlands. The royal company stayed for a few days at Worcester before moving on to Gloucester. Then the progress set out for Bristol, where the mayors, sheriffs, and citizens met the king about three miles outside the city to welcome him. At the city gate, there was a pageant where the king was greeted as a man sent from God. In the center of town, a maiden representing prudence welcomed the king and assured him of the constant love and prayers the town offered him. For the feast of Corpus Christi the following Thursday, the king processed to the town green where the bishop preached. After evensong, the king publicly announced his appreciation. The pageantry of this first Tudor progress set the stage, so to speak, for the years of progresses to follow. The royal progresses were based on elegant and regal processional ceremonies designed to present the monarchs in all their majesty and magnificence. Rich clothing and spectacular jewels adorned the king and queen and set them apart from the rest. The pageants created by the cities and towns included in the progress also manifested an interest in dramatic presentation that later found its fulfillment in the Elizabethan stage plays. But even in the earliest Tudor progresses, the pageants and performances give us a hint into the beliefs and anxieties of the realm. The performances in this first progress of Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York gave their new subjects a chance to tell their stories to the new king and queen. They offered the king a key to the city, which represented in many ways a key to their hearts and their loyalty. In return, the royals demonstrated the strength of the dynasty and its promise that the years of war and bloodshed were behind them. Although that wasn't quite true, it was true that Henry VII's reign, despite rebellions and challenges to the throne, would last for 24 years. Furthermore, the Tudor dynasty established would last for more than 100 years, taking the country into the 17th century and a grander position on the European stage than anyone could have imagined. Henry VII surely would have considered his three-month tour of the north of England a success. He made important steps in consolidating support for his realm and his family. Three months after he returned to London, he would celebrate another essential component of the dynasty that he had envisioned, the birth of his son, Arthur. The first year of his reign had put the dynasty on solid ground. The king's visit to the north was part of that success. Henry's progresses, built on the success of his first one, contributed to his success in consolidating the country around his reign. Henry VII's 1486 progress was the first of the Tudor dynasty. Now let's turn to some progresses later in the dynasty, those of Henry VII's granddaughter and the final Tudor monarch, Elizabeth I. When Henry VII came to the throne, he was a relative unknown. He had spent the, first, the previous 14 years of his life in exile in France and Brittany. Scholars think it was unlikely he had spent a single night in the royal palace before he became king. His early progresses literally introduced him to the people. Elizabeth I had different reasons for her progresses. Her people knew her. She had lived in England all her life. 
although disinherited before she was three years old, she was always acknowledged as the daughter of Henry VIII. She was frequently at court during the final years of her father's reign, during much of the reign of Edward VI, and sometimes during the reign of Mary I. As Mary's final illness set in, there was a steady stream of courtiers to Elizabeth's household at Hatfield as she waited to become queen. In fact, Elizabeth's accession to the throne was in some ways the least problematic of the Tudor reign. The deaths of Henry VII, Henry VIII, and Edward VI were all kept secret for a short time, while the ministers rushed around to arrange things for the future reign. Mary I's death and Elizabeth's accession were made public immediately. So why were Elizabeth's progresses so important? For one thing, Elizabeth understood the importance of her popularity with her people. The notion of female rule was still troublesome to the people of England and around the world, and her half-sister Mary's reign had not been entirely popular. To have a second woman on the throne was unsettling, to say the least. In addition, her mother had been unpopular during her lifetime and vilified after her death. The issue of illegitimacy haunted Elizabeth. Catholics around the world, and in her own country, believed she had no right to the throne. She needed her people's support to hold on to her throne. In addition, she knew the danger of rebellion. She had seen the rebellions against Edward and Mary during their reigns. She knew she had been seen as an attractive alternative for the Pro Protestants who opposed Mary's choice of a Spanish husband. Now, there were attractive alternatives to her. In particular, there was Mary, Queen of Scots, who claimed the English throne right off the bat. Mary would be a potent threat throughout Elizabeth's reign. Elizabeth believed that the goodwill and loyalty of her people was one of her greatest tools in the protection of her reign. From the beginning, she cultivated an image of a caring queen. During her coronation procession, she stopped to listen to her subjects in their pageants. She spoke to them in return. She even paused to speak with supporters along the way, something criticized by foreign ambassadors as being beneath typical royal behavior. But Elizabeth knew what she was doing. She was creating strong bonds of loyalty that she could rely on in the future. Elizabeth recognized the importance of appearance. She carefully created an image of a loyal subject dressing plainly during the reigns of Edward and Mary. Now she used the same grand style her father had to set herself apart from those around her. Her outfits as queen became grander and larger throughout her reign as she lived and leaned into the statement that a thousand eyes saw everything she did. It was essential she share that image beyond the court. Although she didn't travel far and she never left England, Elizabeth took her special show on the road in regular progresses. In the first decade of her reign, Elizabeth went on an extended summer progress each year except 1562. She usually left London in July and was gone an average of 50 days, returning in September. She preferred to stay with her subjects, at their expense, by the way, and typically stayed two or three days with each one. In contrast to Henry VII, who headed north to turn away potential rebels, Elizabeth I stayed close to London and friendly neighborhoods. In the early years of her reign, she visited nearby counties. Although it was true that the roads closer to London were the best and the safest, and Elizabeth didn't want to travel into areas with difficult roads and terrains, there were more complicated reasons for Elizabeth's limited geographic scope. She deliberately avoided areas with known Catholic sympathies. She used her progresses to validate and strengthen her existing authority and popularity. She sent representatives to carry her messages to other locations. Much as the northern cities and towns had pulled out all the stops to greet Henry VII, cities and towns devoted money, time, and effort to welcome Elizabeth. Citizens were asked to repair roads, fix buildings and homes, and update wardrobes to greet the royal court. The city and town leaders organized pageants and performances. Churches and cathedrals put on their best sermons and services. Civic leaders usually chose the perfect gift, often something like a gold cup full of coins. It was a, an expensive proposition for the area, 
but leaders recognized the value of a royal visit. It provided an opportunity to petition the queen and her closest advisors in person for economic aid, support with the courts, and intervention in disputes. A royal progress also helped cities establish and strengthen their influence, and it gave everyone an opportunity to work together and then bask in the queen's presence and pleasure. Elizabeth's first progress in 1559 was to Kent and Surrey. She left London on the 17th of July for Dartford, visiting Lord Henry Cobham at Cobham Hall. He welcomed her warmly. A few days later, she left and stopped at Gillingham and Otford on her way to Eltham Palace. Next, the Earl of Arundel hosted her at Nonsuch, and a few days later, she was off to Hampton Court. Then came a visit to her Archbishop of Canterbury, Matthew Parker at Croydon. Then Lord Edward Fines de Clinton, who was the Lord Admiral, welcomed her to his home in Surrey. All along the way, the Queen was entertained with plays and pageants. The Lord Admiral even built a banqueting house for the visit, where he presented a mask and his best food and drink. Other early progresses followed similar patterns, with nearby stays, loyal hosts, extensive and expensive entertainments from individuals and villages, and the warmth of loyal support. The lack of progress in 1642 is, I'm sorry, in 1562, is likely because of a smallpox epidemics at court. This is the same one that nearly killed the queen that October. But the other years saw the queen visiting towns and manors so she could see and be seen by a cross-section of her subjects. There were always cheering crowds and ringing bells. There were always magnificent displays by the court and eager presentations and petitions by loyal subjects. Behind all the glory and success of the progresses was an extraordinary effort and often crushing expense. Since Elizabeth preferred to stay with her subjects, it was sometimes to their delight and sometimes to their horror. The costs of hosting the Queen on Progress was enormous, and while courtiers like Robert Dudley and William Cecil considered it worth the cost, others did not. In fact, when the Queen planned to stay with Sir Henry Lee late in her reign, Sir Henry wrote desperately to Robert Cecil, begging him to change the Queen's mind. He feared he would go broke if he had to host the Queen. It was a tremendous effort to transport the court around the countryside. The royals did not travel light. It could easily take up to 300 carts to convey provisions and clothing for the monarch and the court. In addition to food and clothing, the king or queen often brought a bed and a throne, as well as silverware, tapestries, elements from the court chapel, and other significant objects to maintain the image and work of the court. Official business continued as the court traveled. That meant that in addition to household staff and everything and every one needed for the grand display at feasts and festivals, people associated with the actual running of the court had to travel and be accommodated as well. There would be between 1,000 and 2,000 animals, nobles, and servants all traveling together. Officers, guards, and others could come and go with the size of the court shrinking and growing as necessary as it moved around. But there was always a core of hundreds of people and many provisions on the move. Travel was slow. Roads became less reliable the further from London and other major cities the court traveled. The court could travel about 12 miles a day with bad roads and bad weather, slowing an already slow progress. The travel was, always, was also an opportunity for public display, so speed wasn't always the goal. Often the streets and pathways were lined with subjects eager to catch a glimpse of royalty. Elizabeth in particular enjoyed this, traveling in an open coach or riding on her horse. This provided her an opportunity to stop and speak with subjects along the way. The queen had a special talent for relating to her people. Sir Walter Raleigh is reported to have told James I that one of the reasons Elizabeth was so popular is that she was because, quote, queen of the poor as well as the rich. Thomas Churchyard expressed a similar sentiment, noting that the queen was able to, quote, draw the hearts of the people after her wheresoever she travels. 
the queen made a point of expressing appreciation for the humble offerings of her people, as well as the grand offerings. She was a master of connecting with her people. Royal progresses were an important component in the reigns of Henry VII, Henry VIII, and Elizabeth I. Over the course of the dynasty, Tudor progresses became sophisticated and elaborate events. They provided political advantages as they reinforced royal power and displayed royal magnificence. They provided opportunities for outdoor activities like hunting and picnics. They offered a compelling stage for large cities and small villages to display display their talents and royal support through pageants and entertainments. And they offered the monarch a moving stage to tell the glorious story of the Tudor dynasty. Progresses featured pomp and ceremony, worship and piety, feasting and frivolity. They were important politically and personally to the Tudor monarchs. As the early progresses of Henry VII and Elizabeth I, the first and final Tudor monarchs demonstrate Royal road trips were an important tool in setting the tone for the rest of the reign and the strength of the dynasty. I hope you've enjoyed your summer as much as we've enjoyed ours. Many thanks to Brigitte Webster for sharing her expertise about Tudor summer cooking and summer celebrating, and to new team member Lindsay Lindstrom for all her help bringing royals, rebels, and romantics to life. We're just about ready to kick off season two, which will bring more fun, more surprises, more controversies, more debates, more dangers, and more excitements to the royals, rebels, and romantics of British history. I can't wait. Thank you for joining me for Summer Fun with Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. Hope you had a great time. I'm getting ready to launch season two in September. Big news, great guests, and lots of fun with your favorite royals, rebels, and romantics. Enjoy your August, stay safe, and let's keep shaking up history together. (laughs) 